Well, it's Tuesday, and that means we're, we're up to something a little bit different. And this particular Tuesday, we're up to something completely different because I'd like to start a new series on uh, wiring your model railroad, electrics and model railroads, that kind of thing. Uh, I know it seems like uh, a really simple subject when you first think about it. You take the two wires from the transformer and you hook one to one rail and one to the other rail and the train goes. And it can be that simple, but it can be also incredibly deep and, and uh, interesting and, and complicated. And so I thought uh, it would be fun to do an entire series here on how to uh, wire your model railroad. Now, first I wanted to start off with the differences between uh, direct current railroads and alternating current railroads. And uh, the fact of the matter is uh, almost all railroads use some combination of both AC and DC. But we kind of think about which, which of those two types of electricity are we going to use when we're running the trains? What are we going to run through the track? Anyway, um, First, let's consider what the difference is between AC and DC. Um, we think of, uh, of direct current as just like electrons flowing down a wire. You shove them in at one end and they trickle down your copper wire or some other conductor and they come pouring out at the other end. That isn't exactly what's going on, but it's close. It's close enough that, that we can use that as an analog for what's going on inside that wire. Uh, one way that I've always thought of uh, in understanding how electricity works is to think of it like water in a hose because it behaves very much the same way. So if we were to take two buckets and fill them half full of water and run a hose from one over to the other out of the bottom of the bucket, so the bottoms are connected by a hose, if you were to raise one of those buckets up, the water would flow through the hose and over to the other bucket. Now, eventually, all the water would drain out of this bucket and this bucket would be overflowing. So you also have to have a return system in this kind of uh, direct flow to get the water back from this side to this side. So you can put a pump in between the two to take the water out of this bucket and bring it into this bucket and then at that point, the water's just going to flow around in a, in a circle, a circuit, if you will. So that's direct current. It just simply flows like that between the two buckets. Uh, if, however, we were to take one of those buckets and raise it up a little tiny bit, and once the water starts to flow over here and we start building up an excess of water over in this bucket, we take the other bucket and lower it back down to below the other bucket. And then it, this water is going to drain out and go back into the other bucket. We can raise this one up, it'll go back the other way, lower it down, go back the other way. And so you can rock the two buckets back and forth, if you will, and the water in the, the hose is going to just flow back and forth and back and forth. And that's a really efficient way to move electricity because whenever you're shooting that direct current down the wire, it's creating a magnetic field around the wire. And that's something else we'll talk about uh, later on in depth. But there's uh, this companion to the electrical flow, which is a magnetic field that also moves. But the magnetic field is trying to push the electricity back the other direction. Uh, it's called a, a back EMF, a, a back voltage, if you will. And so what happens is as soon as you shut the electricity off in a direct current like that, for just a split second, there's a burst of electricity going back the other way because the magnetic field is collapsing and the whole time it's been trying to shove the electricity back in the direction it was coming from. So when you shut off the, the, uh, the voltage that was pushing the electricity forward in the first place, it's going to snap back the other way. And so when you're using alternating current, rocking the buckets back and forth, if you will, you're recapturing that energy 
and and then as it comes back this way that's creating a magnetic field trying to push it that way and so then you add some pressure to it you push it back this way and you add some voltage to it you push it this way and you push it this way and you push it this way and what you'll find is it takes very little energy to keep the electricity just moving back and forth or in this case the water in the hose moving back and forth and you don't have to have a return loop either all you have to do is just rock this back and forth and make the electricity go back and forth another fun analogy is uh, if we were to take uh, the granddaughter to the park and if i were to try to pick up a, a 40 pound granddaughter and say here i'm gonna pick you up over my head well uh, that would be difficult for me to do anymore um, however if i were to set her in the swing set at the park and just give her a little push forward the gravity of that is going to be recaptured as she swings back this way so i give it a little push forward and then it automatically recaptures that energy and i give it another push and another push and another and then suddenly with very little uh, energy i'm able to get her five feet up in the air and going back and forth and sustain that just with my fingertips so that's that's how alternating current is so much more efficient than, than direct current. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about in, in model railroads. Uh, the early model railroads used alternating current to run the trains for a variety of reasons, but, but probably the best reason back then there wasn't an easy way to convert alternating current to direct current and because the alternating current is so much more efficient the electrical grid when it was first created and for a while it was direct current but it eventually settled in on an alternating current and so uh, the power coming out of the wall is an alternating current it alternates 60 times a second in north america and 50 times a second in pretty much the rest of the world but it's still alternating back and forth and so if you wanted to convert that into a direct current to run a DC train, you need to run it through something called a rectifier that will take that alternating current and turn it into a direct current that just flows in one direction. And uh, back in the 1800s, they didn't really have rectifiers. Not good ones. They had tubes. And so you could have a great big, huge vacuum tube hooked to your power supply, and that would give you the DC. And another fun system they used to use was to take a, an AC motor and a DC motor and just hook them together, hook their shafts together. And if you run DC into this motor, it'll spin and that'll cause this motor over here to actually generate alternating current. You'll get an AC current coming out of this one, or you can run AC into this motor and that will spin the DC motor and that'll become a DC generator and that'll cause DC to flow out of that motor. So they used to use these, these fun little systems of two motors hooked together to convert AC to DC and DC to AC. We don't do that so much anymore because there are much better ways of doing it. Anyway, back then it was so difficult to create uh, a power supply that would provide DC to the trains cheaply and efficiently. So they, um, they settled on a variable transformer, something called a variac, but it's just simply a big transformer that you can run alternating current into, and alternating current will come out the other side, but it'll come out at a reduced voltage, and then you can put a knob on that to control what voltage is coming out. And so you can turn it all the way down, and there's no voltage coming out at all, and you can turn the knob up, and as you do, the voltage increases on the other side. For what it's worth, some of those early toy trains, they had it so you could turn the knob all the way up and take the 120 volt line current and run it right straight out to the track. And that would be um, dangerous to turn that over to your kids and say, run that around the Christmas tree. Uh, just don't set your arm on the track. Well, so they quickly came up with the idea, well, let's limit that voltage. There's no need to turn the knob all the way up if we just set up our variac so the most voltage that can ever come out of it's about 16 volts then we can easily run that uh, 
to the train. One of the things they used to do too is in those early days, uh, it was so difficult to manufacture the trains. They were all made out of metal and everything. And they said, well, let's add a center rail because that'll simplify building the trains. So they ran the alternating current through the center rail and then the neutral against which this, this alternating current would flow so that you would get a current going this way and then this way to the, those outer rails. The outer rails were just connected to neutral. And that meant that the entire train could be connected to neutral and the alternating power would be just on that center rail. And that meant that the locomotive could have a very simple little shoe pickup underneath the locomotive to pick up power from the center rail and uh, everything else could just be neutral. So you could just make it all out of metal and you didn't have to worry about insulating or isolating anything. And the alternating current would just simply be picked up by the shoe underneath the locomotive and make it run. For that reason, um, it just became kind of a, a tradition and a standard that alternating current railroads have a center rail, direct current railroads, run the power through the outer rails and they just create that flow, that circuit of electricity between the two outer rails. That makes building your trains a little more complicated because you have to insulate everything since you got power on this wheel and power on this wheel, it's going to all want to short out. So it's more complicated, but as the direct current railroads became much more the norm, then they quickly went over to running the direct current through just two rails so they didn't have to have a center rail and alternating uh, current railroads always used a center rail and there have been some deviations from that over the years some direct current railroads have a center rail and some alternating current railroads use the two outer rails but for the most part when you see three rails that means it's an alternating current when you see two rails, that means it's a, a direct current. Hope that makes sense. Should make sense. I think it makes sense. Anyway, I hope you want to follow along on this series as we go. And um, the easy way to do that is to become a subscriber and turn on your notification bell and the little notification thing. And uh, the easy way to become a subscriber is by clicking on the upcoming blue button. Are we ready for that? Zoink! Right there, the blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. I hope you don't find this series boring. And we will see you here on Sunday with that kind of fun. See you then. Bye-bye.